We talked to a lot of guys on the phone and they laughed a little bit when they heard that me, Jimmy, and Greg were running our own wrestling organization. The XWF was one of the many promotions that sprang up following the end of two of the biggest companies the business had ever seen. It was an attempt at being a WWE alternative featuring a bunch of past, present, and future stars of the industry. Like a few of the other shows I've covered, and will continue to cover here on the channel, this promotion was really just the lingering elements of an already dead brand. It boasted a roster that consisted of the likes of Hulk Hogan, The Nasty Boys, Mr. Perfect, Vampiro, Buff Bagwell, Psychosis, Juventud Guerrera, Johnny B. Bad, Simon Diamond, Johnny Swinger, Vito, and it even included some future stars like AJ Styles, Christopher Daniels, and Loki. Even outside of its star-studded roster, there were major names in managerial roles. Mean Gene Okerlund acted as the interviewer and voice of the company. Tony Schiavone and Jerry the King Lawler did commentary. The former Sable and future Mrs. Brock Lesnar, Rena was brought in as the brand CEO, with Rowdy Roddy Piper being the company's commissioner, and many, many more. The star power attached to the short-lived Fed shouldn't come as a shock. As the company was run by one half of the Nasty Boys, Brian Knobs, his legendary manager, Jimmy Hart, and Greg the Hammer Valentine. But they really tried to go above and beyond and have the show act as a spectacle, even trying to cram in just about every celebrity they could, from Gene Simmons to Paul Stanley. Hey, the Kiss Demon needed some sort of endorsement. I mean, somebody had to co-sign that mistake. Alice Cooper shows up for a split second to remind you what you're watching. And Willie even stops by to say something about something. The company had a lot of green screen promos from wrestlers that otherwise didn't make an appearance on the first show, but would later show up in future episodes. This happens a lot in between segments and are only seconds long, so no one really ever has anything of note to say. It feels like the you're watching Disney Channel of wrestling promos. They show up, they say their name, and then they shout in your face. It's kind of goofy, but I think it's a nice staple that sort of gives the brand its own distinct identity. What I find way less endearing is the Mouth of the South Jimmy Hart and Nasty Boy Knobs, 1B, popping in between matches to tell us how great the XWF could have been. It really seems like they're desperately trying to sell you on the company. And knowing how crafty that Jimmy Hart could be, I would say that they probably were. It's like they were making this for wrestling fans in the hopes that they would see this in the store, buy this, and then immediately go online and petition for another season of their show. At some point, you just really want to tell them to stop complaining and just show the show so you can judge them for yourself. Although I do see the irony in what it is that I just said. This show makes me realize that WCW didn't die. It imploded, and the remaining pieces were scattered throughout the indies where they grew and formed into their own separate but similar brands. Like so many shows out at the time, it has the stench of WCW all over it. They even have their own Nitro Girls who are referred to as the X-Girls here. Like a lot of the other shows I've covered from this time period, I think it had a lot of potential, but was plagued with problems. Before I even go down the card, there's a bunch of grievances that I need to air. And just overall things I'd like to note, but I couldn't figure out where exactly to put them, so uh, here they are. When the show opens up, we're introduced to Jerry the King Lawler, who then introduces audiences to his manager, Kitten, who does nothing of note except stand there and look pretty. Money well spent. Now, that's strange enough as it is, but what makes matters even more bizarre is that this was clearly a dig at Lawler's very recent ex-wife, a former valet slash wrestler, sort of, called The Cat. I don't know, I just kind of feel like you would have won more if you would have said nothing at all. Jerry Lawler also tells Tony that she's there to attend to their needs, which reminds me I now need to shower to wipe the sleaze of the 90s off of me. There seems to be a lot of emphasis put on the expression no more prima donnas, no more politics, which is a strange slogan for a brand that's proudly promoting Hulk Hogan all over their merchandise. A man who kind of exemplifies just that. Mind you, all of what I've explained thus far wasn't an example of the Fed as a whole. All of that was just a footnote of the first show. The madness runs much deeper here. We haven't even gotten to the match card yet. In the company's inaugural match, Big Vito takes on Buff Bagwell. Once again, definitely adding to the whole WCW vibe the show already had going for it. Before the match even begins, the Nasty Boys show up in the wrestling equivalent to a pop-up video and let the audience know that they're back. 
They have nothing to do with the match. They just make a cameo in a side bubble, letting you know that they're teaming up again. Wow, way to take the attention off the two men actually competing. The two have a pretty standard wrestling match for the time that thankfully isn't harped down with an excess of gimmicks, a goofy finish, or countless run-ins. Which may sound like the bare minimum you could ask for in a wrestling match, but for this time period, I assure you, this is an absolute triumph. Buff spends most of the time working the crowd, though they can't seem to figure out if they're supposed to cheer him or boo him. So right, wrestling historians are still trying to figure that out to this day. The match is short but sweet, ultimately being a competent effort by a strange pairing. The psychology is definitely lacking, some no-selling ensues in favor of rushing to the next spot, but honestly, unfortunately, that was kind of the way wrestling was at the time. Look, in my opinion, not that it means anything, wrestling is very effortful, so it should look as such. Taking a big move and then acting like it wasn't impactful does nothing but dull the impressiveness of said move. If a move looked like it hurt, then those in the ring should act like it hurt. Popping back up after a big spot really just feels like it does a disservice to the actual physicality of wrestling. Again, just my opinion. I think the highlight of this has to be Vito's bumping and selling for Buff's stuff, because he makes him look like he's more than just enough. <laughs> Nice. Anyway, a decent start to the show where Buff gets the win. We follow this up with the XWF Cruiserweight locker room, complete with XWF shirts meeting with the new commissioner, where we can make out some notable names here like Juventud Guerrera, Prince Ikea, and future stars like AJ Styles and Loki. The Cruiserweights ask Piper for an opportunity, to which he promises them one. You are a mer- the rocker Marty Jannetty takes on Jimmy Hart's latest acquisition, Hal. Unsurprisingly, Shawn Michaels' former tag team partner is dismantled by the former Lord Humongous in quick fashion. Marty gets no offense in, and is really just brought in to ragdoll for a big guy. Despite looking like a brute, Hale's arsenal doesn't feel particularly brutal. As a matter of fact, everything he does looks incredibly safe. It looks like he's in the very early stages of his career where he's literally afraid to hurt those he shares a ring with. Be that the case, that's very noble, but it also takes a toll on his in-ring abilities. It's not the worst squash I've ever seen, but it's far from the best. This match did nothing for me. I'm not impressed by the monstrous hail, I'm not sympathetic for the easily beaten Marty Jannetty, and I've officially wasted more time talking about this match than anybody did when putting it together. Following up the introduction of a big man is the introduction of another big man. It feels weird that you'd have one of those matches right after the other. This time around, we're following Ian Harrison as he takes on Hulk Hogan's nephew. Poor Horace. Even with nepotism on his side, he still can't be granted so much as an entrance. This guy somehow both has so much working for him and so much working against him all at the same time. Harrison, to his credit, has a really impressive and somewhat scary-looking physique, as well as just a regularly eerie appearance. He's a scary man! Oh, if you can win a match with a scary face, it's gotta be the world champion! Oh. He seems to play the part a lot better than his predecessor, flexing for the camera and shouting like a maniac as he does. See, I don't know what this guy's deal is, but I'll tell you what, I'm interested. It's... it's something. Take no tail. This is how it's done. Harrison dominates the competition, and his moves look incredibly painful. Uh, some of which, I bet, feel painful as well. The whole match is just dedicated to showing off his strength, as well as disguising his weaknesses. Truthfully speaking, it is a lot better of a presentation than the previous match. It even has an ending that sees a submission via the big man's thighs, which is a sentence that I just said. Solid squash. By the way, I'm not the only one making comparisons between these two matches, as immediately after we're shown Brian Knobs comparing both men and their similarities. And this is right before he boasts, We had a variety of wrestlers, something for everyone. Is that something the same thing twice over? Well, here's something different. The XWF Cruiserweight Championship is on the line in a battle royal of cruiserweights from WCW past and TNA future. AJ Styles, Christopher Daniels, Kid Cash, Loki, Juventud Guerrera, Psychosis, Kid Ikea, and someone named Billy Fires. Not that any of that matters, because despite the talent involved, this match is far from a top-tier title battle. That's not to say that there isn't effort being put in by who's in there, 
because there clearly is, but it's too much effort by too many people all at once. Some entertaining or fun spots get lost in translation as the camera struggles to figure out which set of wrestlers it needs to land on. The XWF division glides around the ring in an effort to knock everyone else out of it. I don't know, cruiserweights in a battle royal feel about as strategic as powerhouses in a ladder match. They're always too quick to jump in the air, which really isn't ideal in a match where you want to stay grounded. There's some really fun sequences here, but most of them are barely caught on camera. A bunch of them sort of just get lost in the chaos of the match. It has its moments, but most won't remember them when it's over. It's a match that does too much to show off the abilities of a division, but not enough to showcase the stars in said division. When a random appearance of Josh Matthews becomes the focal point of a match, when he's not even involved in said match, an error has been made somewhere down the line. And hey look, I love the tough enough loser turned commentator more than the next guy, but the kid was a charisma vacuum at this point in time. He looked just as confused being there as I am watching him. Kid Cash wins the title and takes Josh Matthews backstage. Alright, I can't wait to see where that's going. Next up, it's the return of the Nasty Boys, as Knobs and Sags reunite after a four-year absence to take on a team that would later be called the Johnsons. Now, this match confused me, because since the Nasty Boys are back, you would think that that would make the Nasty Boys faces. However, they're still acting like heels. But that's understandable, because they're the Nasty Boys, and they're nasty. That's kind of their whole thing. They're really only faces by proxy of the crowd liking the gimmick. But they kind of don't interact with the crowd at all in this one, so I have no clue what the intention of this appearance is. It isn't until the end of the match when the Nasty Boys lose in a surprisingly quick fashion and act like sore losers and attack the Shane Twins. But this attack causes the Road Warriors to come out and make the save. So you bring a major tag team out of retirement for this event. You have them play heel when their return is bound to get cheers. And I'm assuming that the thought process was to have them continue to team. But then you immediately have them lose to an unestablished team to bring out another big time established tag team who you're not wrestling on the card? All I'm saying is if this is the show's first event, and they had both the Nasty Boys and the Road Warriors backstage, why wouldn't they just have them work each other? All credit due to the Gemini here, but and no one knew who they were at the time. Simon Dean didn't even know who they were at the time. Aside from bad booking and a quick finish, the in-ring action isn't bad by any means. But to be fair, my last memories of the Nasty Boys is from their poorly thought out TNA run. So seeing them work in the manner that they do here was quite frankly a very pleasant surprise. I mean, it's not a WrestleMania worthy match or anything, but you know, it's, it's good until it isn't. I can tell the Shane twins aren't fully seasoned, so to speak, but they looked like they were on their way. And somewhere out there, there's a Nova applauding. The Legion of Doom grabs some unplugged mics and starts screaming something about the Nasty Boys into him. Again, maybe it'd be better to start your fed off with the fight between the two. I think more old school fans would be more inclined to tune in. And you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. It's main event time, as Vampiro takes on Kurt Henning. Vampiro cuts a promo about the resurrection of Vampiro, and this whole setup just feels very reminiscent of his WSX promos. Oh, I'm sorry, promo. The two are actually working well together, something I wouldn't necessarily have guessed from their contrasting in ring styles. But they have a nice pace back and forth with moves that wow the audience. But don't get too comfortable with good in ring work here, because abruptly the match ends with a pretty nonsensical finish. Bobby the Brain Heenan, who is standing in the corner of Kurt Henning, tries to pass him some brass knucks. But crazed Commissioner Piper rushes down to the ring grabs the Nux, and then hits Henning with them to give Vampiro the win. This show just leaves me scratching my head thinking, Who who's the face? Who's the heel? No one cares. Rena and Piper celebrate the win with the winner as the show comes to a close. I don't even know what I'm supposed to be feeling from that finale, but I can tell you what I definitely do feel. Disappointment? I can tell you what I'm most disappointed by. A part of me expected to somewhat like this show. Like, I didn't think it would be stellar by any means. I thought it would be a little bit lame, but, you know, I'd find some redeeming qualities in it and find it somewhat entertaining. But no, this whole situation has left me feeling like I'm just as bad as the guy who spread the tape in the ring by, by, by making this review and putting it out into the world. I mean, no bad's gonna come of it, but, you know, 
definitely no good. I'm really hoping that somewhere down the line we'll find a show with some potential that at least half lives up to it. But for now, we're left with this. A roster filled with names, attractions, talent, and bad booking. With that being said, if you like this video as much as I didn't like making it, and you want to see me cover the next episode of XWF, let me know in the comment section below by leaving a comment saying, What does the X stand for? I am vengeance. I am the knight. And that was V Infuso. Just remember, if you're not tuning in, then you're missing out. So, if you like the words that came out of his mouth hole, and you too would like to become a V-generate, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching, nerds! And if you're not joining the fun, you're in for one bad day. And you know what they say about having one bad day. <laughs> Catch him next time. Same bad time. Same bad channel.